All righty, well, it is our official start time. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce you if you're ready. Yeah, let's do it, sounds great. All righty, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our second ever uh, GVM virtual program. This evening, we're lucky enough to be joined by Travis Rupp, who is the Innovation and Wood Cellar Manager at Avery Brewing Company in Boulder. Uh, known as the Beer Archaeologist, Travis has worked at Avery for eight years and is responsible for the company's beer invention, innovation, and barrel aging programs. In 2016, Travis launched the Ales of Antiquity series to celebrate the journey of brewing through time. Since 2010, he's been a lecturer of classics, art history, History and history and anthropology at the University of Colorado Boulder, uh, teaching all things Egyptian, Roman, and Greek. Uh, he's also writing books on the beginnings of beer in the ancient Mediterranean, brewing in the early monastic tradition, and brewing during America's Revolutionary War. He's also been featured on CNN, CBS This Morning, NPR, and in Southwest Airlines Magazine, Food and Wine, Zimbergy, and Thirst Magazines. Uh, Travis's favorite beer is Maharaja IPA, an imperial IPA that is regal intense and mighty. So without any further ado, I'll hand it over to you. Um, I'm also going to ask all of our participants to please not start your video. You might slow down our Wi-Fi a little too much. And uh, we'll have Q&A at the end. I'll moderate the questions in the chat. Um, here we go. Travis, take it away. All right. Thank you very much, Peter. And thank you, everyone, for uh, coming out today to to join me this afternoon or this evening, I guess it is, and talk a little about uh, ancient beer. And so, yeah, as Peter was uh, discussing with my two jobs, working for both the University of Colorado at Boulder and then also uh, at, at Avery Brewing Company, um, I've kind of fallen into uh, a, a nice little interesting niche where I work primarily on ancient food and alcohol, primarily alcohol um, in my academic career, though that's not how I originally started, but that is uh, is often what happens with uh, people in in academia, especially when we work in such a small program or in such a specialized field like ancient archaeology. And so, um, as Peter was saying, I started teaching at the University of Colorado in 2010, and I am an archaeologist by trade. So most of what I do uh, is at that time I was working primarily just on Roman art and archaeology uh, from the second century CE. And, uh, but as, as, as things go after 10 years of teaching at the university, I teach all kinds of things, um, Greek art, uh, a lot of Egyptian material as well. And then um, I started working at the brewery in 2012. And when I started at the brewery, I literally was just interested in getting involved in the industry. I wasn't necessarily looking uh, to start a project like the one uh, that I did. But over the years, I kind of worked my way through uh, the rungs at Avery Brain Company and now uh, being in charge of the Innovation of Wood Cellar program, uh, it's kind of nice because I get to do a lot of experimentation. And in 2016, when I joined that team, uh, I was uh, basically tasked with just coming up with new beers. That was my, my job uh, before I took over the program. And one of the first things I decided to do was try to recreate historic ale. And I wanted to recreate an ancient Greek beer because the vast majority of history and scholars say that uh, the Greeks simply did not drink beer. And that really bothered me as a classicist because, and as a brewer, because beer seems to be readily available everywhere. And so since uh, about 2011, I've been uh, working on and kind of dabbling in food and beer history, but in 2013, it really took off and it's kind of become what I do. And so this evening, uh, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna talk a little bit about my, my research and kind of uh, survey uh, where it all began and where really beer does seem to begin, at least in the Western Hemisphere, and talk a little bit about the archaeology of beer and how I go about the process of doing uh, what I do. I can't really complain because I have two hobbies that basically have turned into jobs. And I also have a very understanding wife because I am full-time at both. So I'm a full-time professor and a full-time brewer. And it's an inter interesting little puzzle to weave together uh, on a daily or weekly basis. But as, uh, as Peter indicated uh, at the beginning here, um, when, in 2016, I started this program called the Ales of Antiquity. And uh, having all these various titles and doing uh, what I do, and I will soon be teaching classes for mechanical engineering as well at CU on, uh, on ancient food production, as well as on how to make beer today. Uh, but bringing all this together, it's been kind of an interesting little study 
Uh, and what I would say basically I do is it's kind of experimental archaeology as it's often been deemed. So um, I do travel a lot. I spend a lot of time on the ground in locations I choose to research and be serious. Uh, and uh, not only do I take in the ancient processes and do a lot of reading, obviously, and do a lot of on the ground um, analysis and, and, and examination, but uh, I also uh, do kind of an ethnographic study. I, I'm very curious in what modern peoples in these regions are doing as well, because even though some of the beers and some of the uh, locations we're going to talk about today are obviously thousands of years old, uh, modern man and modern people in those locations still keep a lot of ancient traditions alive, surprisingly so. And so with the Ailes of Antiquity program, we've released 10 beers in the Ailes of Antiquity series thus far. Uh, number nine is, I was actually just notified before I got on, is uh, almost sold out. They had to crack into my secret stash at the brewery to pull out um, some of the 1752 India Pale Ale. Uh, and then Monticello was my last Ale of Antiquity that I released uh, for uh, on President's Day this year uh, to honor the individuals who brewed beer at Monticello. It's actually uh, in uh, commemoration of Peter Hemmings, the enslaved brewer at the estate of Monticello. And so that one's still available at the brewery. And I'll talk a little bit about the next one that's coming up um, potentially this year. It kind of depends. Uh, our release schedule for beers is a little wonky with the pandemic. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, there will be many, many more to come. I will either retire or, or die probably before I run out of ideas for the program because beer seems to be everywhere and it's deeply ingrained in essentially every culture. So as I was saying before, um, as a part of the Ailes of Antiquity program, one of the things that um, I've been able to do in this experimental archaeology and recreate the past is really work with the same materials that they would have worked with in antiquity. And running the wood cellar, running the uh, the the, the barrel program at Avery has kind of given me a glimpse into that world already. There is one aspect of modern brewing that hasn't changed all that much, and it is this process, which is the barrel aging uh, process. Now, what I do with a lot of the Ales of Antiquity, though, is I barrel ferment them because the vast majority of ancient beers were fermented in wood. Uh, so at times, the, the challenge that comes into play is trying to figure out how to recreate the historic process because a lot of modern equipment for brewing is simply not built to do uh, what the ancients did. Um, and it doesn't really like to play well or play nicely with these ancient processes either. But running the program, and this is our barrel warehouse at Avery, which fluctuates in volume, but it's been as high as uh, 4,600 oak barrels that we have in house. We tend to typically though, try to keep our stock around a thousand or so, uh, which is what we're a little bit closer to now. Uh, but um, all of this, you know, being much more hands-on, much more intimate with the process of brewing as a barrel wrangler um, led me to start looking back into antiquity. And where, where I work or where I live most of the time is in this region, uh, the ancient world. When I refer to the ancient world, I'm, I'm typically talking about the ancient Mediterranean because I'm a professor of classics and uh, Egyptian study. And so I live in this area and this is where I've spent the vast majority of my life uh, working. But one interesting thing about uh, the topic of beer history and one of the questions I get asked, honestly, more often than most is how old is beer really? Uh, and what came first, bread or beer? Uh, the ongoing debate that will probably never be fully resolved uh, almost like the, what came first, right? The chicken or the egg. But uh, that constant debate is ongoing. Uh, but what's really cool and interesting about uh, new techniques and, and uh, new uh, uh, analyses or new, I should say, sciences that are coming out, allowing us to understand and study the ancient world in a more intimate way, the date keeps getting pushed further and further back. As a matter of fact, one of the oldest known locations where beer was being produced is in uh, modern day Turkey. Uh, or in ancient Anatolia uh, at a place called Gerbekli Tepe. And that location, which is in southwestern Turkey, is one of the oldest known locations in the entire West that was being used on a regular basis for uh, a multitude of things. Uh, it was probably originally a religious location or some kind of religious sanctum, or at least a place that hunter-gatherer peoples would, would congregate at on a regular basis. And interestingly enough, with Gerbekli Tepe, though it, the, the ruins there do date back to 9000 BCE, 
probably somewhere between 9,000 and about 7,500 BCE, they started to produce beer. And how we know this uh, has to do with the vessels that are found there. Here are a couple of examples of uh, these 42 gallon fermentation vessels or tanks that were used for alcohol. We're pretty certain of that. Um, and why, one way or one reason we are able to, uh, to, to, to identify that and say for, for certain it was beer and not some other kind of food source is that in the uh, archaeochemical an, uh, analysis uh, of the, the vessels, oxalates from grain uh, that are that's been converted to alcohol alcohol will embed themselves in the stone and when we run uh, analysis on these whether it be gas chromatography or um, some kind of chemical analysis uh, when those oxalates appear it's usually indicative of actual fermentation uh, and so the question then uh, to kick it back to what I said before is well why were they first cultivating grain to begin with were they cultivating it to make beer or was it to make bread and I think personally, but I'm probably a little bit biased as a brewer, that I, I think it's very likely um, and, and probable that it was for beer originally, only because uh, the, we often operate uh, under the, the false pr premise that uh, the ancients were dumb, right? They didn't know any better. They didn't know what they were doing, but uh, they probably knew just as much as us, if not more, because they couldn't just rely on computers and technology to tell them what was going on. And man, uh, you know, 10,000, 11,000 years ago was going to know pretty quickly or pretty early on that certain water sources were not safe to drink. But it has been proven that as little as 1% alcohol by volume in a liquid will kill upwards of 99% of bacteria in that liquid. And so beer was just a safer thing for them to drink than the water in some instances. Uh, bread certainly is a good food source and it, it's good for sustenance, but it's a, a, a laborious process. It's also a bit, um, uh, it takes them a while to actually figure out how to make a gluten-based bread. A lot of early breads were probably more like rusks, as they're called, or barley rusks. that are not as, not as easy to consume, nor are they all, all of that easy to digest uh, because of uh, their, their makeup. And so I think it's possible that beer did come first, but also in that same sense of examining and thinking about uh, evidence for uh, beer production in this region, uh, there is some, uh, there, there's some climatic survey that's been done and some, uh, some research on just the topography and the ecology of this region. And here what we're looking at is a map just south of Turkey. We're down in what is modern day Syria. Um, here you can see just off, this is the, the far eastern, the dark uh, gray color is the far eastern section of the Mediterranean island of Cyprus there. And what this is showing uh, is about around 10,000 or so BCE uh, to around uh, 8,500 or so BCE, we know that this region of Syria was actually heavily forested. Um, it did have a, a lot of uh, greenery, very, very counter, uh, you know, very much uh, the contrary to what it is today, which it's a very arid climate. But for some reason, and it, we actually know what that reason is likely, it was a major climatic shift that occurred, a, a, a mini cold snap or almost like an ice age that came through the region uh, that killed off the vast majority of the forests. And what came back in their stead were all these wild grasses. Um, by about 8,500 BCE, so 10 and a half thousand years ago, all of the, all that forested area was gone and it was replaced instead by pockets of wild cereals, primarily wheats and barley. So these are the predecessors to later cultivated and domesticated crops. These were all wild crops, of course, at that time. Also, interestingly enough, the archeological record shows that right around that time is when man actually started to move a little bit away from their hunter gatherer um, techniques. Uh, and if you look at the, this is in BP, so before present, um, basically coming up to the current date. So if we start around 9,500 BCE down at the bottom and we work our way, uh, you know, work our way backwards in time, or I should say we uh, starting closer to the present at the top of working our way backward, backwards in time to 9,500 BCE, what this uh, chart actually yields is that man was cultivating crops much earlier than we think. Um, in fact, 
there is evidence to support that they were actually going out and harvesting these cereals potentially as early as 9,000 BCE. And then certainly by 7,000 BCE, we have uh, agriculture taking, uh, taking root uh, somewhere really between eight and 7,000 BCE. And it's very possible that beer production completely coincided with this in those early phases. But because we're in a period at that time where we're in uh, primarily a, a proto-literate or illiterate culture where there's no documented uh, or no documentation of these, these food or alcohol processes, we have to rely on later evidence to really support a beer tradition. And we do know that it's firmly in place by 5000 BCE and then moving forward, uh, Sumerian residue tablets uh, and tests, I should say Sumerian residue tests uh, indicate that there was beer being produced by 5000 BCE in ancient Sumeria. Tablets start showing the process in Sumeria by 4000 BCE. Beer starts to readily appear in Egyptian grave goods in the Old Kingdom. Uh, one of the best representations of this comes from 2650 to 2575 BCE. And then the very famous Sumerian hymn to Ninkasi was eventually written in 1900 BCE. There is also the Epic of Gilgamesh, uh, which references and discusses the presence of beer uh, and the importance of beer uh, to these early peoples. And I'll come back to that here in just a moment as well. But uh, the archeological record, the artistic record also shows a thriving beer culture. And all throughout Egyptian history, we find things like these, these funerary stele uh, or grave markers that show individuals consuming beer directly out of the clay pots that the beer was probably fermented in. We also find tablets that have writing indicating either good beer or the processing of beer, or even at times how beer was rationed out. See the Alulu beer receipt on the left, and then the very famous hymn to Ninkasi uh, that uh, it's often called a beer recipe. It's more kind of walks through the process of brewing beer as opposed to giving specific ingredients for a beer, uh, but nonetheless, very, very detailed accounts of this process. And clearly to these peoples, beer is not a bastardized uh, drink. It's not menial in any way. It's not as though it's uh, uh, superseded by wine, even often in many contexts in these ancient uh, locations throughout the Near East and in Egypt. Here, even in modern Iraq <clears throat> at Girsu, the ancient location of Girsu, uh, another Sumerian tablet that indicates how much beer was consumed. On a monthly basis, barley rations were given out um, to make uh, both food and drink, and uh, the drink was broken down by pints. Uh, adults would consume 30 to 40 pints of beer a month, children 20 pints of beer a month, and this again on this cuneiform tablet here from 2350. But to come back to Gilgamesh, one thing that I absolutely love about the story of Gilgamesh and, and this account of, uh, of, the, st of, of the flood, if, if you're familiar, the Epic of Gilgamesh is another uh, recounting of a flood story from uh, this region of the world. Uh, but what I love about this quote, and I'll read it uh, very uh, briefly here that I take out, talks about the evolution of man from primitive to cultured. And it seems that beer might be the thing that makes man a cultured individual. It says, Enkidu, a shaggy, unkempt, almost bestial, primitive man who ate grass and could milk wild animals, wanted to test his strength against Gilgamesh, the demigod-like sovereign. Taking no chances, Gilgamesh sent a prostitute to Enkidu to learn of his strengths and weaknesses. Enkidu enjoyed a week with her during which she taught him of civilization. Enkidu knew not what bread was nor how one ate it. He had also not learned to drink beer. The prostitute opened her mouth and spoke to Enkidu, eat the bread now, O Enkidu, as it belongs to life. Drink also beer as it is the custom of the land. Enkidu drank seven cups of beer and his heart soared. In this condition, he washed himself and became a human being. And even in the Epic of Gilgamesh, to learn beer, to know beer, to consume beer makes him human. Consequently, just in reference to, the, uh, to Gilgamesh, though it is another recounting of uh, the flood story, uh, to bring in uh, some other parallels to the biblical tradition, uh, a topic I've worked on quite extensively, won't discuss it quite as much in this lecture, but uh, barley comes up often uh, in the Tanakh or the Old Testament of uh, the Christian tradition 25 times. And in fact, uh, there is reference to uh, 
uh, wine, obviously, in the biblical tradition, but also uh, in, in my endeavors, certainly uncovered other references to different kinds of alcoholic drinks, one in particular um, that I do believe was beer that was uh, purely inoculated with wine to basically start fermentation. It was um, like 90% barley based. Um, sometimes wheat was part of it and they would just use grapes to start the fermentation. So it's interesting to see that parallel there as well. Other uh, instances where we hear of or reference, uh, hear, see references to uh, a beer uh, and its usage is from Babylon as well. Um, Texts in, in ancient Babylon indicate that the daily beer ration was based on social standing. So the higher rank you had uh, in society, the more beer you would consume or receive. And it's quite a bit, as you can tell, based on social standing, administrators or high priests could receive up to five liters of beer a day versus a normal worker at two liters a day. Uh, beer was not sold though, it was bartered. It was used to uh, gain things, uh, whether it be uh, for trade or to get labor done or work done, it was bartered out. Uh, now you might be wondering, you know, that's a lot of beer. I mean, were these people just drunk all the time? Uh, were they hurting pretty bad? You know, what was, what was the deal? Uh, we do have to remember that the vast majority of, of beer uh, from the ancient tradition, from this ancient tradition anyway, uh, was probably pretty low on the alcohol uh, by volume scale. Uh, many many uh, scholars have presumed that it was somewhere around one and a half to maybe two and a half percent alcohol by volume. So it's not really much alcohol to cause any kind of intoxication. Uh, again, we don't know, nobody will really know exactly what the alcoholic concentration was without some experimentation. So when I've done experiments and recreated Egyptian beers, um, they usually don't go over three and a half percent alcohol. Uh, and I would assume that it was probably lower than that in antiquity because modern, even though I'm trying to recreate the process, a lot of the modern environs in which I work um, or even just uh, the way um, we handle beer today is much more um, kind of like it's a, you know, an occupation and we're focused on it so intently that we're trying to extract as much alcohol as possible. So I think it's likely in the ancient world it probably was quite low. Uh, then as well, probably sub 3%. On the right hand side is the Code of Hammurabi. Though it doesn't reference these beer rations, what it does reference are laws even uh, that were passed down to, to bar keepers. And we actually know uh, when this was written or when it was transcribed on this, uh, this plinth here in 1772, or at least by 1772 BCE, that there were bars open where beer was consumed and there were laws put in place of what to do when people were overserved. actually. Uh, so it's kind of interesting to see those references already in these texts. But to move away from the ancient Near East and move to Egypt, I wanna talk a little bit about how Egypt is slightly different because uh, with ancient Egypt, it often is discussed completely in correlation with the ancient Near East because there was so much exchange and interaction back and forth of uh, the two major entities or, or factions in antiquity. But one thing that I think makes Egypt a little bit different potentially is the evidence we have for a brewing industry that a lot of beer was being produced on a very, very large scale in Egypt and it was distributed all throughout the Nile Valley region. And for the Egyptians, we're here in a little bit, we're gonna talk about the ancient Greeks and Romans and they certainly saw beer as a menial, uh, uh, item. Uh, it was certainly um, below, if you will, wine. Uh, they poo-pooed it constantly in any kind of literature that was written. So the question then becomes, is that the way beer was seen all throughout the entire Mediterranean? Well, no. Um, in Egypt, it was very much celebrated. And barley and beer almost go hand in hand with the etymology and just the, uh, the literature and the liturgy of, of uh, ancient Egypt. Uh, eat in Egyptian, you see the hieroglyph word on the right-hand side of that top bullet it was Egyptian for barley. A common spelling is right below, and it actually shows uh, the contents being poured out of a container, almost looks like a barrel or some kind of terracotta vessel. Shma was uh, the word used for upper Egyptian barley, and it was usually shorthanded to just be that vessel. Uh, this would serve as the symbol for upper Egypt even often. So upper Egypt is everything upriver, everything down in the south of Egypt. 
And then there was there are also references to uh, Sumerian uh, to the Sumerian term Akiti, which was uh, the term for barley in ancient Sumeria, and potentially why there's a little bit of overlap in the etymology of the word there. But still, uh, what about this idea of a rise of industry? Well. Some of the oldest known references to beer production actually come from the Delta region of uh, Egypt or the Delta region of the Nile. Uh, most notably, uh, just a few years back, uh, back probably 2016 or so, 2015, 2016, uh, they were doing, uh, they're running excavations at this location known as Tel El Farca. You can see it here on the map on the left hand side, very close to the ancient city of Tanis, made famous by Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, but Tel Farka yielded some pretty interesting evidence. In fact, what they found were a handful of these odd kind of circular slash ovoid shaped structures. Now, the site was occupied as early as 3600 BCE, and this is in the pre-dynastic era of Egypt. This is well before pharaohs even came in or kings had started to rule. That doesn't start happening until somewhere between 3100 and 3200 BCE. But the site was eventually uh, uh, abandoned uh, in 2600 BCE. So it's very early, its occupation is very early in Egyptian history. But what they kept finding there were these kind of things and this aerial view of it, it looks like a very odd kind of wonky, messed up, almost like a building collapsed in on itself. But in fact, that's not what it was. Um, of the, the three well-preserved and potentially two others that were found at Tel Farka, these structures, you start peeling back the layers, they start to reveal uh, kind of a, uh, an arrangement within the building. And these are, these are features that are found all throughout ancient Egypt, all down the Nile, uh, to be honest, and they are breweries. Uh, this is a 3D reconstruction of what you were seeing there. Uh, in their arrangement, this one, uh, these at Tel Farco were about 12 by 13 feet. Um, they were not covered or roofed structures. And what you saw that had fallen down into the lower parts were simply just the barrier walls. Um, these walls were built to be windbreaks so that when they had their fires going, uh, they wouldn't blow out. So they were brewing beer essentially in the same way we do today. They would malt the grain. Um, and in malting, uh, what you're doing is you're basically tricking the seeds into thinking they're going to produce a plant by soaking them in water, steeping them in water. And then once they start to right before they sprout or right after they sprout, you expose the seeds to extreme heat, which kills the seed. It's not gonna grow into a plant, but what's left behind is a whole bunch of really good starch uh, that can be converted into sugars for, uh, for fermentation. And uh, that's basically the process that was being undertaken in uh, buildings nearby. And then they'd start brewing here. This is their mash tun, their boil or their kettle, and then the flat area over here was likely used as a, uh, another location for a mash or, or a kettle or possibly a packaging hall. And when they package, they pretty much just put them into uh, these amphorae, if we want to use the Greek term, these terracotta vessels. And uh, they were producing a lot. Some breweries were producing two, 300 gallons of beer a day. Uh, most brews were what we call two-day brews. So they would brew uh, a batch of, within 48 hours, it would fully ferment within 48 hours. Uh, they put it in vessels, ship it out, and beer starts to become a major business. Gateway between Lower and Upper Egypt, between Nakata and Lower Egypt, um, distribution abroad even potentially. Um, vases that were used for the uh, transportation of food source out of the location of Tel El Farca have been found this far away, even across Sinai into the ancient Near East. And so it was a booming industry and it was a surplus industry way more this wasn't just home brewing these people were brewing beer to sell to barter if you will uh and uh to give out to the general or to the larger uh, populace on a regular basis now one other thing to be said about the 48 hour window is because these were two-day brews which is indicated in a lot of the archaeological record and actual tomb texts um, that have been found in ancient egypt the presumption by ancient scholars has been that the beer was chewy, um, was probably quite disgusting to drink, that it was almost like a porridge-like consistency with a lot of yeast still in suspension. 
Uh, and uh, as a result, the, the, that idea, again, that the ancients were dumb, didn't know any better, didn't know what good food was, starts to come back into play. I will tell you, when we recreated our ancient Egyptian beer, which dated from about 1800 BCE, I went through the same process uh, and fermentation occurred in 48 hours. It actually stopped fermenting within 48 hours. Um, a lot of other scholars had thought that the, the, the ancient Egyptians were drinking the beer while it was still fermenting and it would have given you a raging hangover. Um, hangovers typically come from a lot of yeast left in suspension or a lot of sugar content still in the beer. Uh, where there was still quite a bit of yeast in suspension, the yeast was flocculating or it was dropping out of the beer uh, going anaerobic when uh, the fermentation finished on, on our batch that we made. And it was actually really quite nice. It was not chewy. It was not porridge-like. It was quite refreshing, um, slightly sour. Uh, and the brewers uh, actually loved it. It was one of the favorites amongst the brewers, um, probably indicative of the style of beer because it was definitely a, a beer that was made uh, for the working man. Other, uh, another reference to that though too, where beer uh, was made for the working man. In ancient Egypt, beer was almost a currency and beer was something that was celebrated by every facet of society. So much so that here we're at the Valley of the Kings way down south in Upper Egypt uh, where Thebes is, or just outside of Thebes. And in 2017, the tomb of Kansu Imheb uh, was found. The entrance to it is back here in the corner. Sorry, the image is a little pixelated here. Uh, but uh, back in the corner is the entrance to the tomb of Kansu Imheb. And within the tomb of Kansu Imheb, uh, the remains were found, uh, sorry, 2014, not 2017. 2014, it was opened up. Uh, and uh, this 3,000 year old tomb of the brewer was found. In fact, Kansu was a royal brewer. He brewed beer for Amenhotep III, uh, who was the grandfather of King Tut, uh, according to a traditional or um, uh, traditional understandings of the, uh, the chronology of those, those pharaohs at that time. Uh, but there were royal brewers and they were brewing beer not just making wine. So it's, it's pretty cool to see references to that there in the record as well. But to then move a little bit further ahead and move away from ancient Egypt and talk a little bit about the Greek and Roman worlds, where the ancient, the, obviously the ancient Near Easterners and the ancient uh, Egyptians loved beer. Um, and it was very much at the core of their, their culinary culture. Uh, the Greeks are, are a tough one. And as I said, with the Ales of Antiquity series, what started the whole project for me was I was becoming a bit frustrated that so many individuals just said, Greeks didn't drink beer, never did it. They only consumed wine. And I found that to be quite shocking, a really, really shocking statement because uh, virtually every other people surrounding them consumed beer. Uh, and a lot of the assertions that were being made as to why the people of the Aegean or the Greeks didn't consume beer was because there was no writing about it. There were very little, little re literary resources to indicate that beer was consumed. So I spent a good chunk of time uh, in, uh, in the area, in the Aegean uh, and in Turkey uh, back in, let's see, it would have been 2017, uh, doing, doing research, or I should say, no, 2015, doing research. Um, and in order to release the first Ale of Antiquity in 2016. And a lot of my attention was focused on uh, the, the island of Crete. Um, Crete is an interesting uh, location in the Eastern Mediterranean because of its, its connection to the vast majority of all of the major empires of the Mediterranean. It has direct access to Egypt, Israel, Troy, the Greek mainland, Sicily, Italy, Carthage, you name it. It was kind of a centralized hub for the distribution of goods and ideas, which is why I thought if there's any way that beer or some kind of beer culture made its way into the Greek world, it probably came through Crete if it was something that was learned from another culture. And in doing work on Crete and then eventually going directly north of it to the nearest uh, island of Thera or an island that you might know better as Santorini. Uh, on the island of Thera, which is a, a, an ancient volcano that uh, blew itself apart somewhere between 1450 and 1350 BCE, there are ruins uh, from the ancient Bronze Age and uh, the Greek Bronze Age and they 
are colonies that were established by the ancient Minoan peoples. And one in particular is the location of Akrotiri. Akrotiri is on the far southern point of the island of Thera. And uh, excavations were undertaken there in the 1960s and 70s, or at least that's when it was originally discovered. It is still an active archaeological site. Uh, the vast majority of the community broke off in a, uh, in a, a, lands, in a landslide, essentially, in the, when the shelf cracked during uh, the eruption. And it's now out in the open water a couple miles off, uh, offshore. But uh, the part that is still up on the shore's edge is about five blocks or so, residential blocks of the community. And in doing work there, this is what the, the, the location currently looks like today. It's um, underneath this big awning that's been built. But what, always, what has always intrigued me, even before I went there, but then after being there and working uh, as intensely as I did on a lot of the artistry that was left behind by these Minoan peoples, I found it quite fascinating that so many of the items that were left behind had these various uh, vegetal motifs and they were grasses or they were cereals that were being depicted in, in the artistry, which is quite intriguing considering that again, these are Greek peoples or they're Bronze Age Aegean peoples prior to Greece becoming a unified location. But these, this was supposed to be a, a culture of the grape, culture of wine. But you don't really find a lot of artistic, in many instances, no representations whatsoever artistically of wine or grapes. And I look back at some of the old rector, records from the 1970s and 80s as well of the excavations and found other vessels like this one in the foreground um, in this very poorly preserved image, but clearly has this grassy vegetal motif. And then um, newly discovered in the excavations while I was there was another one that had, again, this grass motif on it. And going to museums throughout the area as well, and then eventually ending up back in Athens and doing uh, some work at the National Archaeological Museum in, in Athens, uh, they have collections also from Akrotiri. And oddly enough, this one, um, which was not on display, but I was able to pull it up from a catalog of stuff that was in uh, the, uh, the archives of the museum. Uh, this nippled ewer jar has clearly what appears to be barley on it. It's indicated as a nippled ewer jar with a barley motif. And uh, Spiridon Marinatus, the individual who found uh, Akrotiri, he wrote in the archaeological excavation reports that apparently libations were poured on the tables of offerings to assure a good crop of barley. And my question then would be, or what, how my wheel started turning on that was, well, if you want a good crop of barley and you're pouring a libation for it, what kind of libation is it? Would you be pouring wine? Or why wouldn't you potentially be pouring something made out of barley? And then newly uh, put on display in 2015, we were there, a brand new exhibit that it opened showed this, another uh, ewer jar, nippled ewer uh, jar with barley motif from uh, Akrotiri as well. And the, Barley fronds are so beautifully preserved on the front of the jug, and it really started getting me wondering what in the world was in these vessels. Well, I ended up uh, coming across uh, the full set of the excavation reports from the site while I was on the island at this little bookstore, and I thought, I thought the uh, the guy who owned the bookstore was going to fall over when I told him I'd buy the whole set because you could tell they've been sitting on that shelf for probably forty or fifty years. But he's like, "Sure, I'll I'll even cut you a deal to take them all." So I took them all. And while I was kind of going back and forth um, from location to location in Greece, I was reading them on planes and, and not. And one evening on a flight, I came across this passage uh, in the text, and it really struck me. Uh, and this is the, the, the man, Spiridon Marinatus, who, who uh, found the location and started the excavations. Unfortunately, he was killed in 1974 at the site of Akrotiri because the awning that they had built at that time collapsed on him and several other archaeologists. Uh, and he was killed, um, which is quite unfortunate. But um, as it says, we found a small broken pithos in the bottom of which there were found this substance, which were arbitrarily called flour. When the vase was found, the substance in the bottom, about five to eight centimeters thick, was found in shrunken state, and the side walls of the vase did not touch it. Under the influence of heat, dryness, or both, it had lost part of its original mass. Examination under a strong lens showed that the substance was in fact barley flour, which it had been very imperfectly ground. 
The farina had disappeared, but the bark part of the barley grain could still be seen in the form of thin needles or small straws. Some grains of barley that had slipped through the millstone were found intact. It was evidently not perfect flour, but coarse, and something like the Homeric Olukatai employed in the sacrifices. And why I found this so striking and, and so important was what Spiridon is actually describing here was not flour. There were, there were deposits found that had perfectly ground flour in them. So this was intentional. This was intentionally done. And this is what it was. It's spent grain. The farina was gone because they had brewed with it. But what were left behind were the needle-like husk substance from the, from the, uh, the grain. Um, after the brewing process. And this same account comes up several times in the excavation reports. So it sent me on a little journey of looking at Bronze Age uh, brewing. And in the second part here on the topic, uh, we turn to the city of Mycenae uh, and we go to the Greek mainland. Now on the Greek mainland, or on, I should say not on uh, necessarily the, the Thessaly mainland proper, but on uh, the Peloponnesus down in the south, there are three well-known uh, Mycenaean citadels, but there are honestly dozens of them all throughout the Mediterranean, some of which are even found in Sicily and southern Italy. But the Mycenaeans were also a people thriving basically at this same time. And why they're of interest to this examination is that uh, they are the peoples that likely Homer was writing about in the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, they were the Achaeans that sailed up to Troy to fight the Trojan War in that uh, mythological cycle that may be rooted in some kind of historic past of the ancient Aegean. But if I'm looking at Mycenae or looking at these Mycenaean citadels, it means that finally I have a literary source to go off of. I have literature. It's the first written Greek in the ancient world was Homer, the writing of the Iliad and the Odyssey. But there are individuals that have indicated or questioned um, a lot of things about Homer and uh, want to take him fully at face value. For example, in this, uh, this article um, from 2010, uh, Alberger and Guppel argued that Homer does not mention beer because his focus was on glorifying a heroic past. This echoes ancient interpretations which postulated that there were no references to Homeric heroes eating vegetables, fish, or fowl because any food other than roasted red meat was somehow considered inappropriate to their dignity. And I think that Alberger and Guppel um, have an interesting, uh, plant an interesting seed here because we can't just look at Homer and say whatever he writes in there is exactly the way the Greeks were living or exactly the way the Mycenaeans were living at that time because we know they're avoiding some realities in order to build up the idea of the hero. So in examining locations throughout the Mycenaean world, and looking at, for example, Nestor's palace, which is uh, at the location of, of Pylos or Pylos, which is on the southwestern edge of the Peloponnesus, a well-known uh, palace structure that's been heavily excavated and, and well-supported and survived. Clearly, this location was a place that people liked to drink at. Um, it, there were probably a lot of drinking parties. For example, this red box here, uh, though you can't see my cursor, the one that uh, says 104-105, this big box on the right hand side, uh, that's a wine hall, it was a wine magazine storage area. So wine, a lot of that was being consumed. Um, also in the Mycenaean world, all these rooms surrounding it uh, were full of cups, drinking vessels. So there were a lot of, like I say, drinking parties that were being undertaken at this time. But for us as archaeologists, sometimes our best friends are city dumps, places where a lot of things are being deposited, discarded. And what this map is showing is the distribution of stemmed ware, stem, drink, stem drinking cups. A lot were found in the palace, but also a lot were found out at the gates of the community. In fact, over 7,000 of them were found. And so I looked at some of the analyses also from the 90s of locations down along the coast. And where a kingly presence might be present at the Palace of Nestor and has the leisure to consume large quantities of wine, I wondered about these peoples that lived down on the shore that were feeding the king, taking care of the royal family, if you will. And at the same time, I wanted to know if there are any words in the Greek language 
for beer. I mean, yeah, Homer doesn't mention it. Why doesn't he mention it? Is it because there is no word for it? Well, if we blast forward a little bit past Homer, Homer wrote his stuff down in the 8th century, so somewhere between 70, 750 and 700 BCE by most scholarly accounts. Moving forward from that, when Greek becomes a bit more standardized, there actually is no word for beer. Uh, there is a Greek word, brutos or bruton, which just means a brewed beverage. Some scholars have argued that it's a Thracian word, but there are no indications that it was rooted in the ancient Thracian peoples. You can see them on the map on the right-hand side, uh, center top, that's where the Thracians came from. But typically we have to go off of different kind of uh, Greek uh, accounts, like this line here, tas krithos este pomo kataleus, and they grind barley for a drink, but they don't say flat out that it's beer. So if the Greeks were doing it, did they learn it from somebody else? I mean, the Egyptians were making beer by this time readily, we know that. The Thracians were as well. So the Greeks are kind of nestled in between these two peoples. Is there anything else in the literary text that indicate beer production? Well, there is a hymn, the Homeric hymn to Demeter that has this interesting account of, uh, of the goddess uh, Demeter. Uh, Demeter who was uh, the goddess of the harvest, the goddess of nature, basically oversaw good, uh, the crops and animals. Uh, and her attendant is kneeling in front of her on the right-hand side. And essentially what this passage says from the Homeric hymn is that Metanira comes to Demeter and she tries to offer uh, a cup uh, to, uh, to, to, the, to the goddess uh, that was a mixture of bar, uh, uh, or I should say was a mixture of wine, a honey sweet wine likely. And Demeter immediately refuses it. She says, no, take it away and bring me the mixture of barley and water, she says. Bring me the barley drink. And I found that very interesting because again, yeah, it doesn't flat out say beer, but there is no word for beer. She's rejecting wine, but asking for the barley mixed with water instead. And in fact, when you dig into it a little bit more, Homer also has some accounts of this. Uh, in the Iliad, there are references to this drink called kukeon. Um, and I give you the passages there if you want to look them up. Or in the Odyssey, it's also referenced several times, this drink kukeon. What is kukeon? Well, according as it's, as it's recounted in Homer, it's a mixed drink. It's a drink uh, that's a mixture of wine, barley beer, and mead. And it's blended together and consumed um, often at religious festivals, but also in the, in, the, in the Homeric tradition, it was usually consumed um, by men uh, and they would end up in some kind of intoxicated stupor. Consequently, what's interesting about it in the Homeric tradition too is it's always a woman that makes the concoction and gives it to a man who she is trying to intoxicate. Patrick McGovern, who you may have heard of, Patrick McGovern is also a, a beer historian, alcohol historian, he's a professor at Penn. Um, he uh, wrote a book called Uncorking the Past. And in that book, um, he argues that uh, wine, beer, and mead uh, were separately fermented and then, uh, uh, and then mixed together and drunk. Uh, but the beer, plain and simple, was never consumed by the Greeks. And I just find that very hard to believe. It's uh, really unattested anywhere in antiquity that they would make wine, mead, and beer, never drink the beer, but only save it for this one blended drink. And actually archeological and archeochemical evidence um, says that that's probably not the case. There's, uh, it probably was not a mixed beverage at all, but the successive use of the vessels for wine, beer, and mead. Because yeah, when you run analysis on the pots, as McGovern has done, you get um, these interesting hits um, of all of those elements in the glass. So mead was there, wine was there, beer was there. So it must have been something that was all blended together and drunk, never drank separately. Well, the problem with that presumption is that it'd be like when I'm done drinking this glass of water, I just throw the glass away. I don't clean it. I never use it again. But of course, we know the ancients didn't do that. They often would reuse their, their vessels just like just like we do. And so those microbes will get ingrained and embedded into the clay. And then when we run analysis on them, it's gonna hit that it had wine, beer, and meat in it. And it's not as though 
uh, they were always blended, they could easily be drank successively or at different sessions. And that work came from uh, Sidzikas and Martlu and uh, their biome biomolecular investigation, which McGovern was also published in. And so um, I think it's, it, it's an interesting, a little bit of interesting food for thought, but this idea of kukeon, which does include beer, nobody's disputing that, nobody is disputing that it had barley-based beverage in it, it's found all over the place. There is evidence for kukeon production in Kania, from Mycenae, from Arminui, and from Medea, uh, Medea, all of these locations it's been found. Even, I love the one from Medea, which is a feeding bottle for a child. So was the Homeric kukeon produced in a cup and it was blended together there? Um, or was it blended in some big vessel and then people dipped into it? Um, that's the question that really comes into play. But from, by a modern account, from a modern standard, kukeon is beer. If you, if you water down wine in any way, shape, or form with a barley or cereal-based beverage, it is no longer wine. Wine is considered a pure beverage, at least by modern standards. So if we're analyzing these drinks from a modern perspective, by putting barley in there, they are creating beer. These are other cups that have been identified as Kukeon cups from Minoan Crete, and I love the vegetal motif on them. It so reminds me of what was found um, at Akrotiria as well. And again, this is in a location where um, certainly grapes, all that really grows on the island of, of Akrotiri, just to come back to it for a moment, the only thing that grows there uh, are grapevines. It's extremely arid. Uh, barley and cereals do not grow on that island. Uh, but it's interesting that we don't get references artistically to them. They're referencing things that maybe were harder to come by or maybe harder to, to, to produce. Uh, when, we, when I finally got around then to creating the first Yale of Antiquity, I based a lot of my analysis also to come back to Nestor's palace and what I found from the excavation reports and on the ground outside of Pelos um, doing work uh, where all of those port towns were. What I found really fascinating about the archaeochemical and archaeobotanical analysis is what you see on the left-hand side um, uh, from Papa Thanasiu, a publication that she put out in 2015, are the remains of cereals and, um, and organic material that were found in the archeological record. And they're in order of density. And you'll notice how far down on the list grapes are. But look at how high things like emmer, einkorn, barley were. So when I made our first Dale of Antiquity, it was a little bit of a stab uh, in the dark because I didn't, um, it was the first one I was making and I made it more based and in, uh, inspired by these uh, accounts based on things that were readily available to them. And Nestor's Cup was the night that we uh, adjuncted or fruited with elderberries and figs. And it was also brewed with acorns um, because these were high in the archeological record and usually beer is produced out of things that are readily available. Now, after I came out with the theory that yes, in fact, the Bronze Age Greeks absolutely uh, were producing beer and presented my evidence in, in, at several conferences. I certainly uh, was still um, highly, being highly scrutinized by individuals who didn't believe the Greeks ever produced beer. And then what was absolutely wonderful about uh, that was in December of 2017, um, two archaeological excavations were concluded uh, in uh, Thessaly, Arkadinko, and Argisa. And at both locations, they found firm evidence for Bronze Age breweries. Um, they both date uh, to, in fact, even earlier uh, than, the, um, than the evidence I was basing my argument off of. Uh, there was evidence for intentional malting and fermentation. Emmer, einkorn, and barley were all found. Lumps of material were found that seemed to have been cultures or starters uh, for fermentation. Beer mugs, a lot of beer drinking cups, uh, and I thought also, interestingly, uh, though I haven't written anything on it yet, um, I thought it really uh, quite phenomenal that the rooms were arranged in a tripartite arrangement, almost exactly like the tripartite division of the breweries in Egypt that we were looking at at Tel El Farca. And um, here what they found to indicate that certainly um, we, there was, uh, it was uh, basically um, fossilized evidence or archaeological evidence of grain that had been purposefully sprouted. Uh, and then the sprouting had been stopped. So we have malt here, and this malt would be used for the production of beer. 
That's what you see in the bottom image. The top is one of those lump starters um, for yeast fermentation. And here are just a collection of some of those drinking cups that were found as well. Now the problem with understanding Greek beer though, uh, beyond that is that um, they don't talk about it all that much. I mean, when you get into the classical era of Greece, so, so if we're talking the period from 480 to 323 BCE, we are in the age of wine. And the reason why we're in the age of wine, and I just highlight a couple of authors here, and I'll go through these a little quicker um, just in the interest of time. But with these classical authors like Aristophanes, Euripides, people that we know well, they don't typically offer uh, anecdotes on beer. And because of that, some have just presumed, well, the playwrights would have said something about it. And if they didn't, maybe it never existed. Uh, and Aristophanes, a, a comedian, he doesn't really talk about it at all. Um, he says the poor have wine, but the wealthy have better wine. That's all it is. And I give you a note at the bottom for the only time brew, maybe short for brutos or bruton was used and nobody knows what it's supposed to be for because it was in reference to a child and it's from a fragmentary piece of, uh, of uh, his uh, drama that we, we don't have the full uh, body of work for. Or Euripides, the tragedian, uh, he says if one doesn't drink wine, they drink water. The people just don't drink beer. Uh, he even goes so far as to say that comestibles of cereal and water are satisfactory to no one. Now, this kind of gives the indication that he knows what beer is, or that maybe he's referencing beer, but it seems that he doesn't like it. Well, one thing we have to keep in the back of our minds about the classical era of Greece is the literature that we have is all being writ written by affluent men. Only 1% of the Greek population was literate. Of that 1%, we only have a tiny, tiny fragment of literary sources that still exist for us today, and only a tiny fragment of those people were writing material like these plays. And as a result of that, uh, we have to take what they say with a grain of salt. I mean, just imagine if we left it up to the upper 1% of our population to write all of our history. I guarantee we would see almost nothing written about beer, right? If we left it up to the upper 1% of our own population. But when you go digging into some other uh, contextualizations from the time, there are indications that beer was being produced. Uh, but again, yeah, if you, if you take it completely, uh, completely uh, at face value, to completely literally, there is no word for beer. So it's hard to track that down. But even in the Hippocratic Oath, written by Erotian, uh, in, in Hippocratic ph Philosophical Thought, um, there, is, there are references to zulos uh, and zuthos, and these are terms that were used by the Romans to indicate Egyptian beer. And looking at some of those terms as they're used in the Hippocratic, uh, in the Hippocratic text, zulos was a juice. There's a crethes zulos, barley juice. There's even an oinos crethenos, a barley wine or barley, barley water, right, udor crethanone. So there are references to something alcoholic being produced um, likely out of barley. They just don't have a specific word for it. Others have said, but no, still that doesn't mean that the Greeks drank any of it, they just knew what it was. And they say a prime example of that is Xenophon. Xenophon in the Anabasis, uh, Xenophon was a student of Aristotle, who was a student of Socrates um, in, the phil in that philosophical uh, chronology, but he says that there was, quote, barley wine in mixing bowls. The barley itself was on top at lip level and in bowls were reeds, some larger and some smaller that did not have joints. Whenever someone was thirsty, he had to take these in his mouth to suck, and it was very strong unless one poured in water. The drink was very good to the one used to it. And some have said that because Xenophon gives such a, a detailed description of beer, he didn't know what it was. But I don't think that's necessarily the case. He's actually just describing exactly what he's seeing in the same way that the Egyptians would do it in hieroglyphs on the side of a stela. Because they do it on the side of a stela like this, does it mean that they didn't know what barley, was, barley beer was, so they had to depict it in really, really detailed description? No, probably not. Maybe their drinking conventions were a little different for Xenophon, but he knew what it was. And to kind of wrap out uh, our talk today, I'll, I'll finish by talking a little about, about the Roman world. It's where I've been spending most of my time as of late doing work, um, finally coming back to my roots as a Roman archaeologist. 
But with the Romans, uh, the Romans too, we have to take them with a grain of salt also. Uh, in the Roman Empire, in the Roman Republic, wine was supreme. And the reason wine was supreme was because, again, of all of the texts written in Latin, we only have a minor, minor percentage of what once existed in the ancient world. What does exist was written by the upper 1% of the population. And they're only going to typically talk about wine in the really, really expensive stuff that they could afford. But every once in a while, we get an author that yields some pretty phenomenal evidence for us. And Pliny the Elder is one of those. Pliny the Elder, um, who was an a extremely famous uh, aristocrat general, um, made famous because he actually died in the eruption of Vesuvius that would destroy Pompeii and Herculaneum as well, but also was the writer of the natural histories. And he talks about beer, but what he often talks about in regards to beer is that it's something that was produced on the fringes of the Roman Empire. It was something that you would find uh, in the lands they had conquered. You wouldn't typically find it, he gives the indication, uh, readily available in places throughout Italy, though it was there. Uh, but you would find it very, very readily available and very difficult to find wine in places like Spain or in Germanic territories or in Britain um, or basically anywhere outside of the original Roman bubble. But when he does talk about it, he still doesn't always have the nicest things to say about it. He, the only things that he ever really says in regards to uh, the benefits of Roman beer, he does indicate that uh, Roman beer... In the first one here, he basically says that uh, you, you, you drink water um, for your health, you drink milk basically uh, because it's good for your, your skin, but you, uh, you, brink, I'm sorry, you drink uh, beer in order to uh, be good for your sinew basically and your, your tendons and ligaments and things like that. Or the next one, quorum omnium spuma cutem feminarum in facie nutrit, Literally, what he's saying here is that uh, people use the uh, the croissant from brewing as a face cream, and they rub it all over their face, and it's good for their skin. Women, in particular, he says, do that. Croissant, if you've ever opened up a, a fermentation bucket of homebrew, it's all that brown gray stuff that's stuck all over the lid and at the top. It is, for lack of a better term, it's basically yeast poop, uh, and they would gather it and rub it on their skin. These are about the only things he says that are beneficial about beer. Otherwise, he says things like uh, they dry the barley and roast them before prepping a porridge. Uh, they produce malt that soon ferments and develops alcohol. And then he does add that wheat replaced barley as the staple eventually, and that bar wheat beer became a more highly sought after or um, preferred kind of beer over the barley beer eventually. He does also reference uh, people called the Horde R.E.E., um, and they were a group of gladiators. And what I find interesting about them, one of the things I also work on is ancient sports. I teach two classes on ancient sports at CU Boulder. And the Horde R.E.E. have always been interesting to me because uh, this is always translated as the barley eaters, but their name actually, all it means is the barley. Um, and so I wonder if from this reference that he makes to this group of uh, of gladiators, if in fact they are the individuals who drink uh, drink the drink the barley uh, as a beer potentially, but he does reference that. But again, as I said, with Pliny, he talks often about uh, beer as something out on the fringes of Roman society. And though Pliny will not live to see the establishment of Hadrian's Wall in uh, in Britain, um, maybe some of you who are on on in the in the presentation today have been there before. But it's where most of my work has been as of late. I've uh, gone on two research trips uh, to this region uh, of Hadrian's Wall to do work in the last uh, year, and uh, of course prior to the pandemic. Uh, but along Hadrian's Wall is some really, really phenomenal um, resources for what this may have looked like. Because when you get up around Hadrian's Wall and the location of Vindolanda that's in red on the map, Vindolanda is a Roman military fortress. It's a, a military camp that was established um, basically right around the time that Hadrian's Wall was being built, and Hadrian's Wall would be, would be completed in 122 CE. But the Roman military camp, um, what's wonderful about these camps when they're found is that the military would stay there as long as it needed to, but then once the boundaries advanced, they would move. 
and they'd leave behind these permanent structures they had built and the local community would come in and take it over and typically turn it into an ancient town here a reconstruction of what that military fortification looked like in antiquity but the other wonderful thing about uh about this area of britain is that the soil is of a fairly boggy nature and it actually tends to preserve organic materials very well that should have decayed a long long time ago the other reason why they're so well preserved here is the Romans rebuilt this camp multiple times and every time they did to expand it, they pack clay on top of the old remains really, really, really tightly, um, basically um, stopping or um, stunting any kind of microbial activity. But as a result of no microbial activity, things like sandals are fully preserved. They were made of leather. Uh, even writing, actual texts that were written on pieces of wood uh, or on papyri or on pieces of leather in some instances, but these are on pieces of wood. And it's absolutely wonderful. These are called the Vindolanda tablets, or the Vindolanda records. Um, and in the tablets, there are several references to beer. One of the most famous ones was a letter from the Decurian Masculus to Prefect Flavia Cerealis. Um, basically, saying you need to send us more brewers um the guys are getting pissed off basically because there's no beer and uh there's a reference to one brewer in particular uh in another letter a tractus the cervesarius who apparently was a tractus the brewer and he was supposed to be the best brewer in the area so they actually are quantifying what good beer is and beer would have been necessary for them up here they're not gonna wine is not nearly as readily available um, in these portions of England uh, or in Britain, unless it's being uh, shipped into them. But beer, it was readily available all the time. Cereals grow really well in the cold, wet climate in Britain. And so with all of these things being, uh, being preserved there, there's a pretty, pretty detailed record available or pretty uh, complex uh, record available on the fringes of the Roman frontier for beer production as the Roman military interacted with the locals. Another example here, this is uh, actually in Regensburg, Germany, uh, and it's in this really interesting, uh, it's basically just in a residential area of Regensburg. Nobody ever goes over there, but they, uh, you find this little glass building, what's inside of it are the remains of a Roman floor malting facility, uh, and uh, they were standardizing the malting process for large scale brewing. And this was owned and run by the Roman military. This wasn't the locals making the beer. So beer was around. Beer was produced by the Romans, uh, by the Roman military, for the Roman military. And we do, it, it, just like in Greek, where there is no one word for beer, in Latin, there's not a word for beer either. But instead, I would argue that the Romans were the first to stylize beer because they have a lot of words for beer, where there's no one blanket term for all of these things on this slide. They had specific words for the style of fermented cereal-based beverage and where it came from. Cervasia was a Celtic wheat beer. Camum, Celtic barley beer. Zythum, Egyptian beer. Sabaya was a beer from Illyricum. And there are more than that, the list goes on. Different terms for different beers from different locations. So stylization, regionalization. These were referenced in um, uh, some documents under uh, the Emperor Diocletian, who actually also was concerned that brewers weren't being taxed well enough. He actually, tax reforms were passed um, to uh, increase uh, the cost of production on beer so that they could tax raw materials. And that's a story that's been going on for hundreds of years. It still happens to this day. Definitely happened at the turn of the 20th century in England and in the United States as well. And to give you an idea of its breakdown in terms of value, Celtic beers, four denarii, Zytham, two denarii, cheapest wine was eight denarii. So they were seeing beer as subservient to wine. But also at this time, the, the economy in Rome was so completely ridiculously out of whack, um, Diocletian was trying to fix it because honestly, uh, a skilled laborer, or I should say an average laborer, was only er earning about it one denarii a day. So your average Joe couldn't even afford the cheapest of beer from Egypt at two denarii. So a lot of the tax reforms he was passing was an attempt to rectify the broken economy uh, in the third century CE. 
But to say that the Romans didn't drink beer is completely ludicrous because evidence exists, and this would be a topic also for another time. Um, some other work that I started uh, a couple of years ago that I'll be returning to in the next couple of years, but um, where, where they would say it's all from the fringes of the Roman world, no, it's not. On the left-hand side, you see a coin from Metaponto, which is in Southern Italy, and their symbol of their culture was barley, was the barley frond. It appears on all their coinage. On the right-hand side is a sieve jar from Sicily that actually dates back uh, to the Iron Age of, of, uh, of Italy, uh, and it was used to drink beer as well. It was used to filter out the yeast and the, and the solids when, when you were drinking the beer. But there is a lot of evidence and a lot more to be explored um, on the fringes. I mean, according to the Romans, all of this, they considered the Celtic world, even though the Celts were not all thriving in all these regions. It was the area of the other. And those regions that were, quote, the other, were vastly producing beer. It's where a lot of the beer culture we still have today comes from. I mean, as I say, we need to salute those ancient purveyors and preservers of beer. Uh, because they were doing it all over the place. And Illyrian, Thracian, Phrygian, Egyptian, they certainly were producing a lot of it, but it spread all throughout Europe. And all of the names you see at the bottom are Greeks and then one Roman, Galen, who all reference these places as locations of beer production on the Roman frontier. So one thing I would say is that as all, eventually, of course, Rome will fall. And when Rome falls, all of those uh, peoples that were on the fringes were no longer being suppressed by Rome. And those are the people that carry on their culture. And their culture makes it, its way into later periods of European history. And that becomes our history as well. And this traditional view, though, that exists, and this is the traditional view. This is not mine. But the traditional view for the spread of beer is that the Sumerians taught the Egyptians, the Egyptians taught the Greeks, the Greeks taught the Romans, and that the Romans taught those, quote, savage tribes of Britain. And Pliny, Tacitus, they'd attribute, uh, that, that, that all seems fine and dandy in this traditional view of the spread of beer, but it's not accurate. I mean, even Pliny and Tacitus attribute the development of the brewing art to the Celtic and Teutonic peoples of Britain and Central Europe. Even the Romans themselves say, no, the guys that are doing it well are the guys up there to the north. Hence, when we look at a map of beer production throughout the ancient world, it needs to look like this. It doesn't have a bunch of arrows drawn from one to the next because beer was being produced all over the place by different peoples in different ways. And this is the style we have stylization beers today. They had stylization, stylization of beers back then as well. Uh, and for them, beer, beer was something to be enjoyed. It wasn't just something for sustenance. Uh, and that variety that was provided helped push the industry forward. It helped turn it into a culinary art in its own right. To conclude then, as I said, I have the Ales of Antiquity series. And over the last four years, I've done 10 Ales of Antiquity. The first one was Nestor's Cup, uh, a beer from 1350. I did three then shortly thereafter in conjunction with the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And I did an Egyptian beer, Kansuim Heb, Ragnar's Drapa, which was an ancient Viking ale, and Pachamama, uh, which was an ancient Peruvian chicha. Uh, following that, I actually had the wonderful opportunity to go out to Umbria in central Italy for a month and live with monks uh, in the mountains in Italy and brought back their yeast strain and recreated two ancient monastic beers from the ninth century. Uh, and then uh, in conjunction with the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, again, I did a beer for the Dead Sea Scrolls exhibit called Beer Sheba uh, that was based on my research of other alcoholic drinks in the biblical tradition outside of wine. After that, uh, the Ellsman Antiquity series has become a bit more popular and has been growing in momentum. So we've started canning the Ells of Antiquity. Uh, and the last three I did were George Washington's Porter, uh, 1752 India Pale Ale, which was a recreation of the original IPA, and then Monticello uh, that I indicated at the beginning of this talk. Um, I do work a lot in the ancient Mediterranean, but I also, um, as Peter said at the beginning, I'm working a lot on the monastic world, but also on revolutionary, revolutionary America, which is kind of a hobby of mine, and it's turned into a major part of the Ales of Antiquity series. The next beer that will be coming out will be Roman Britain. I have almost concluded uh, my research on the topic. Uh, so it'll be coming soon is the best I can say. Um, like I said, with the pandemic, our, our, our release schedule is kind of thrown off kilter at the moment. 
uh, but it will be the next Dale of Antiquity, and there will be many, many more to come. I actually have three other ones already on deck and ready to go that are potentially going to be released in 2021 if we can get Roman Britain out here in the remainder of 2020. And then I'll just conclude with this. Um, if you want to follow what I'm doing, um, you can certainly follow me or us on, on uh, at Avery on Instagram, Facebook. Um, my website's my beerarchaeology.com website is currently down uh, for, uh, it's under construction, but you can uh, find, you can contact me via my university email. But the best way to follow what I'm doing is on Instagram. Um, I regularly uh, post on there where, and I link it to my Facebook. So it's just nice and easy to pop one of those off real quick. Uh, and that's all I got for today. So uh, Peter, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. I'll, and I'll, uh, I'll leave my screen share up here for just a moment in case anybody else wants to see this and then I'll stop it. Um, in any oh, just go ahead, and, go ahead and leave it up. It's no problem. Okay. Sounds good. Um, thank you for a fascinating talk, Travis. I want to, as somebody who studied archaeology, I want to thank you for addressing the whole um, people think the ancients are stupid thing. Because that yes, always frustrated absolutely. me too. It always made me so, so irritated. I was like, you know, people were making things that we still can't reproduce, mm -hmm. you know? Absolutely. With all, our, with all our technology, we still can't produce some Absolutely. of those tools. So you're 100 percent right. I mean, <laughs> it, it blows me away. That's one of the, the the things that's so much fun about doing this, but also makes it so damn hard at times. Is I can't figure out sometimes how in the world they did it. You know. <laughs> oh yeah. So, pretty wild. <laughs> yeah. Alrighty. Well, I'm gonna start our Q and A. We've already got some questions rolling in in the chat. Sure. Um, this is from Aaron. How does Charles of Charlemagne influence the Roman beer scene is what he asked. Ooh, that's a good question. I mean, um, with, well, I should say uh, eventually later on, uh, it's going to impact the monastic tradition most certainly. Um, eventually, uh, where, the, where uh, the, I should say the, the, that royal institution eventually starts to force monasteries to start producing beer. Um, and when they do that, uh, they were doing it to tax them because, uh, you know, religious institutions were um, void from taxes until that point. But if they produced beer, they could tax it. Um, so interestingly enough, that was um, one way to do it. Um, that's only the big, that's probably the biggest thing that comes to mind at this point. And uh, the first location that received that treatment was actually in Switzerland, um, where he started taxing them pretty heavily. Cool. He's got another question in here. Are the German, I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce this right, but aren't beers similar to the barley motifs? Hmm. That's a good one. That's a really good question. I mean, I don't know. I'd have to look into that a little bit more. I know what, I know what you're talking about with the, uh, the German aren't beers, um, but I'd have to dive into the history on those a little bit more. I'm not sure on that topic. Here's another one from Pam. Is there a concept that the early drinking of beer, you know, everyone got a ration for it, for its health benefits? Yeah, I mean, that's what it seems. I think also when it comes to uh, one thing I didn't get into as much this evening when we're talking about the building of the pyramids, for example, in the Old Kingdom in ancient Egypt, um, the people who built those pyramids were, they were free people. They weren't built by slaves mm -hmm. as Hollywood has made it out to be but they were paid in bread and beer. It was literally their daily payment for work and for labor. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I mean, it was, it was healthier. Um, you're obviously gonna get a lot more nutrients out of that beer than you do um, the water. And obviously the, the Nile wasn't always the cleanest thing to drink either. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so and, and the one thing I would say about that too is, um, if you're, you know, kind of an active uh, runner or workout or anything, I know I, I run a lot. And one thing that I almost, I mean, I get this from Arnold Schwarzenegger because he said so in his book, but he always said he liked to drink a beer after he get done working out because it's scientifically proven that it's packed full of nutrients, you know, that are really, really good for you. And it is very satisfying to drink a beer after a good run, let me tell you. Um, and I think that's also <laughs> part of it too is that they were doing a lot of hard labor and a good way to get the minerals back into their body was to consume beer. Yeah, I've been known to crack a beer after uh, road biking. So there you go. Can That's confirm. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Natalie asks, what do you see as the future of beer archaeology? Yeah, that's that's a great question. I, I mean, I can tell you where I'm hoping my future goes with beer archaeology, but I think like in terms of um, the interest that it's gaining. So mm -hmm. when I started this project um, in 2016, the I only knew of I only knew two other 
ancient, like ancient world uh, beer historians. Patrick McGovern was one of them. And, um, and then there was uh, Max Nelson in Canada. Uh, the three of us were really the only ones working intensively on it. Right. That has changed a lot in the last four or five years. There's a lot of, uh, and that, and just across the, the, the globe and looking at different eras and even in the United States, you know, food culture and food history and food archaeology has become a big thing. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a big movement out in Oregon right now to document um, the beer history and culture, and they're trying to revive old historic beers from 200 years ago out there. Uh, and I think that's part of it. There's a new invigorated um, body of people that want to learn more about it. Um, mm -hmm. But I also think that hopefully that will lend to more funding. Um, for us to actually really, really do this right, because Absolutely. I have to, there are times where I just don't have, you know, all the means, all the funds to really fully recreate the process. But the, right. the more that people get involved in this, the closer we'll be able to get to, you know, replicating the replicating the beer from antiquity. All right. Well, I, I think you're spot on with that, too, because I know experimental archaeology is really taking off, especially with the projects you're doing, because you're producing real world results. You know, yep. it's not like somebody's out there flint napping. That's experimental archaeology used to be things like that. But with people yep. like you who are doing stuff that you can, you can do something with it today. I think you, you, you hit it head on. I think that's the Oh, thing. thanks, man. Yeah, I, I agree. Because that, that's the that's the fun part, right? I mean, as, as classicists, archaeologists, um, historians, it's, it's really fun when you can make history tangible. Exactly. And, so much of what we do is you know, inaccessible. Exactly. And like make it something that's more intimate and personal, personal, personal for the individual who's experiencing the product. And I, I just, I also am trying to rewrite the, that presumption that old beer was bad. And so yeah. far, I mean, it's been, it's been cool. All 10 of these beers that we've done are so drastically different, but every single one of them is quite enjoyable. You know, there are some I've made that I can't, I, I can't say they're my favorite, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I've had somebody tell me that each one of them is their favorite at some point. You know what I mean? Right. It's pretty cool. Yeah. I got another question from Aaron. Um, do you have any plans to make a Devonshire white ale? Hmm. Maybe. It's not on the short list. I'll tell you that. Um, <laughs> but uh, you never know. Cause I mean, like right now it's, it's interesting. I get asked to do a lot of projects for museums. Like I have a project that I'm doing with a museum in Stockholm right now which is supposed to come out in 2021. And so it's funny, a lot of my small projects keep getting pushed back. Like Roman Britain is a beer I've been wanting to do for three years, but other projects kept coming up in front of it. Um, but hey, maybe it might, be on, it might be on that list at some point. There's a funny question from Natalie. Any evidence of gluten-free beer in the ancient world? <laughs> Surprisingly, yes. And so, and what's interesting, it's so funny that she asked that. I haven't read the article yet, but today I was doing some research for, I'm, I'm starting, I'll be offering a new class on food and alcohol in the ancient world next semester um, for mechanical engineering. And um, uh, I found an article today that was specifically on that. So um, if I can dig it back up, I'll, uh, if she want, if she wants me to send it her way, just yeah, have pass, her. pass it along and I'll send it to her. Yeah. Yeah, because it's um, it was kind of intriguing, but yes, it does seem that there were. She says were yes, thank you. <laughs> yep, you bet. Because and that's a good question actually to bring up because a lot of the record does show that they were they would put some wheat in most of their beers, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there are some beers that I found that are like you know ninety ninety five percent barley. Um, well, who's to say they didn't go the hundred percent route, especially based on what's available, right? right. You know, so. Um, yeah, I think it's possible. Here's another question from her that I also think is interesting as an archaeologist. What are your thoughts as, on classifying beer as a material culture? Ooh, I like it. Yeah, right? <laughs> I, I mean, I think we should, uh, you know, because that's what draws all of us as archaeologists to it. Again, back to what you were saying, Peter, I think the tangible aspect immediate, immediately makes it a material culture, you mm -hmm. know, and, and in order to in order to do what, what I'm doing and in order to recreate um, the story behind them, it, you got to study the brewing vats and the, you know, the cups and who was drinking out of what cups and why were certain cups shaped the way they were. That's also a fun project that I think somebody should do. I haven't, I haven't done it yet is that, you know, we look at today with our modern beer culture and we're supposed to be drinking all of these beers out of the proper glass, right? Right. Well, who's to say they weren't doing that back then? 
as well. You know, so. Yeah, I think that's a, sounds like a master's thesis to me. Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions. Um, oh, there's will the link to the recording be emailed to the attendees? Um, I can certainly do that, but it will also be posted to our website once it's uh, finished and edited in response to Catherine there regarding a link to the recording of this talk. So. Perfect. Excellent. Well, thanks so much, Travis. Uh, don't forget, we have Charlie Papazian, September 17th, the father of home brewing, and his presentation is titled, uh, a a century of home brewing, and he actually joined us this evening to listen. So, oh, that's great! Well, yeah. thank, thank you, thank you, Charlie, for being there. He and I <laughs> were we did a thing together. Oh, it was a couple of years ago. We it was uh, cheers to beers for the Colorado Experience on PBS. So I haven't seen him since then. So, oh, cool. Thanks. Well, do you want me to sign you up for his talk? Yes, please. That'd be great. You got it. All right. Well, thank you very much, Travis. Absolutely. Thank you, Peter, and thank you everyone for being here tonight. I really appreciate it. Alrighty. Well, on that note, I'm going to go ahead and stop us. Okay.